Thank you, Titus. We come now to the uh, we come now to the ministry of Jesus. At least the way Luke uh, begins to characterize some of the details of the ministry of Jesus is his healing and his uh, his teaching. Uh, he has already hinted, Luke has, in a couple er earlier verses uh, about what he's going to uh, talk about now in a little bit more detail. If you remember back in verse 14 of chapter 4, uh, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went through all the surrounding community, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So that little two-sentence summary sort of tells you what was going on. He's going around, he's teaching in synagogues, he's uh, doing miracles, he's proclaiming things. And remember when he was in Nazareth, he said uh, in verse, uh, what verse was that, verse 23, and he said to them, doubtless you will quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Uh, what, you have, uh, what we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. So what Luke is now gonna tell us is some of the things that he was doing in Capernaum and some of the things that he was doing in other uh, parts of Galilee as he was going through that region ministering to them. And there is a theme that runs through here and you probably picked it up just by listening to the word being read. The, th the theme that Luke seems to want us to zero in on is the fact that Jesus uh, has authority. Verse 32, they were astonished at his teaching for his word possessed authority and that will unfold itself throughout this entire section that we read this morning in fact it will unfold itself in three ways or at least three ways that i want to pull up, point out the first is that it will be the authority of jesus's word and we're going to see that in verses 31 and 32 and then we'll see uh the authority of g then we will see the authority of jesus over demons in verses 33 to 37. We'll also see that again in verse 41. And then thirdly, we'll see Jesus's authority over disease in verses 38 to 40, and then we'll make some applications about that. But anyway, let's look at this whole uh, idea that Jesus's word has authority. Verse 31, 32, he was teaching on the Sabbath in verse 31, and this verse 32, they're astonished for his word possessed authority. Now, typically, when you see this uh, in, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and, and you hear it explained, at least uh, many of the ways that I've heard it explained, is that Jesus, it's Jesus's pedagogy or his teaching technique that really has authority. Uh, for example, if you think about Matthew chapter five, the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will say things like, uh, you have heard it said, love your neighbor, I say, love your enemy, do good to those who persecute you, et cetera, et cetera. And, and his, in other words, he's contrasting the teaching of the day, you've heard it said, with his own authoritative teaching, but I say to you, do it this way. So that's a, that is a teaching technique. And it is true that Jesus' teaching technique was very different than the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees often quoted uh, other scribes and other Pharisees, and so the authority that they pronounce is not so much their own authority as it is the authority of these scholars who came before them. So Rabbi so-and-so said this, and Rabbi so-and-so said this before him, and such and such was the way typically things were taught. So when you see this, Jesus teaching with authority, what you often will hear people say is, well, he's teaching in a different kind of way. And there's actually some truth to that, that Jesus does teach in a different sort of way, but I don't think that's what Luke's talking about. I don't think it has to do with his style, because if you look at verse 32, it's his word possessed authority. What he said had, not the way he said it, but what he said had power. What he said gave us the sense that he was completely in control and everything. In other words, when Jesus said something, he meant it. When Jesus said he would do something, he did it. And there was no, there was no distinction between his words and between his actions or between his attitude or his intent. The, think of the, the opposite of this would be political speech. Right, a politician gets up in front of a crowd and he begins to say all kinds of things and, his and, and, and you're sitting there listening to the speech and you know 
his words have actually no meaning whatsoever because he is not going to do what he says he's going to do. He, he probably doesn't even care about the things he says he cares about. And even if he does, he's just, he's just appealing to his audience. He's saying what they want to hear. The words are hollow. They're just, and the more words they speak, the more, the more sense you get. They don't know what they're, they have no meaning or purpose. But Jesus was not like that at all. He didn't speak in political terms. What he said, he meant. What he did, he, what he said he was going to do, he did. So his word has authority. Now, remember uh, back in chapter 4 and verse 18 and 19, when he stands up to read the scrolls, he stands up and he reads in, in Nazareth, his hometown, he reads Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then in verse 21, he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today. In other words, I am the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. I am the person whom the Spirit of the Lord rests upon. I am the one who will set at liberty captives. I am the one who will open the eyes of the blind. Now, what does that look like in practical terms? Well, it looks like everything Luke has just outlined in our text this morning. He speaks to a demon, and the demon immediately does something. He speaks to a disease, and the disease is gone. He, he liber this is what it looks like to liberate captives, people that are captivated, or captives rather, to the devil and to the demonic forces and power, people that are captive to disease and suffering and pain and agony. This is what it looks like to liberate them. Here, I'm showing you. This is what I told you I was. I was the fulfillment of this. My word has authority. My word has power. And this is what it looks like. Now, this must have been extraordinarily refreshing for the people of Jesus' day, as it should be refreshing for our day, to know that Jesus took his words seriously. He didn't use words glibly. He didn't use them without thinking or without meaning or without purpose. And every single word is constructed in a particular way to have a particular meaning and potency which is why we take the word of God as seriously as we do, because this is, this is what we have. We have the revealed word of God in the scriptures, and every word is in there for a purpose. Even all, that, even all those genealogies, all those names that, you know, that we listed, they're there for a purpose. They're there for a reason. God didn't, I mean, he, he doesn't just throw them out there to give us superfluous information. He gives them out there for our benefit. Because his word has authority, his word has power. And what was true for Jesus and his word is true for us as well as we have the word of God and the word of Christ in the scriptures as well. So that's the first thing to recognize is the authority of Jesus' word. And this is what people are, this is the first thing people notice about him. He's, he's not like everybody else when he speaks. Here's the second thing, and this becomes just as important. Jesus will demonstrates that he has authority over demons or over the demonic powers. In verse 33, he's in the synagogue. Again, he's a guest in the synagogue. Typically, they, they'll give rabbis an opportunity to say something in a synagogue. That was part of the practice. And so he's given uh, the scripture or he's given, and maybe he's given a sermon. But in the middle of this, there's a man with the spirit of an unclean demon in verse 33. And he cries out with a loud voice, ha! In other words, he, he's going to mock him. He's going to ridicule Jesus. The, the, the mockery is, you can almost hear it in the language, right? Ha, who are you? Who do you, th who do you think? Well, he, he tells them who they are. But he's, he ridicules them. What have you to do with us? The demon says. And in other words, he's saying, what are you doing here? This is, this is our domain. This is our playground. This is, this is where we exercise our power. And here you are? What are you doing here? And then the demon says something very interesting. He says, have you come to destroy us? Now, oftentimes when I've read that, I've assumed that what he meant is the us there 
is the other demons, the other demon forces that were at work in the world at this particular time. And so he's referencing them. He's saying, have you come to destroy us? But there, there actually may be a different interpretation to what the demon means here. The us may not refer to all the other demons. The us may actually refer, the demon could be saying, have you come to destroy me and this person whom I possess? In other words, what the demon is saying is, if you, if you destroy me, you're going to destroy this man in whom I have complete control over. Our, my, our existence, my life is so tied to him, my demonic power is so tied to him that it can't be separated. So if you destroy me, guess what happens? You're going to destroy this man. Now, isn't that interesting? Because when Jesus does perform the miracle, what happens? The demon goes and the man is not destroyed. In fact, the text will say that no harm came to the man. So this is what the demon is, you know, is doing. He's saying, look, what are you doing here? You have no right to be here. This is my domain. This is my, this is my area. This is my authority. This is my rule. And then he says something interesting. He says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Now, Luke will use that Holy One of God synonymous with the Son of God because it will say it later on, verse 41, when it's talking about many demons now, and demons came out of many crying, you are the Son of God. The Holy One of God is an Old Testament reference. There's a few people in the Old Testament that are referred to in that way. But clearly the point is that Jesus is very unique. He is, he is the unique Son of God. He is the unique Holy One of God. And the demons recognize who he is. Also, the Christ. You are the Christ. Sometimes you'll see that in Luke. Those three terms are interchangeable. The Christ, the Holy One of God, and the Son of God. Now, what he does is he tells them not to say anything. He tells them to, to shut up. In fact... He, speak, he simply tell, he tells them to shut up. It's actually kind of rude. He says, shut up, be quiet. And what does the de demon do? Well, the demon shuts up because Jesus rebuked him. Be silent, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst, he came out of him having done no harm. The very thing that the demon predicted would happen, harm's going to come to this guy, you get rid of me, doesn't happen at all. The demon doesn't have authority at all. Who, who's got the power? Who's got the authority? It, it's Jesus. But the interesting question is, why then does Jesus tell him? And why does he tell the demons in verse 41? But he rebuked them. He would not allow them to speak because they knew who he was. Why does he not allow them to speak? And there's a lot of different theories on this. One of them is that he doesn't allow them to speak because it's not the right time. He doesn't want to yet be identified as the Messiah. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's kind of true. But Jesus never lets the demons speak, right? Jesus is always trying to get the demons to shut up, even though they know who he is. And the reason is because I, I think is this, you, you don't want to be defined by your enemies. You want to be defined by your friends. You want to be defined by the people that like you, by the people who have faith in you, by the people who are committed to you. That's the job of the disciples. That's going to be their job to define who Jesus is, not the demons. The demons need to be quiet. But isn't it interesting that the demons know him as the Son of God, that Satan calls him the Son of God, that the prophetic utterances of people like Zechariah people like Elizabeth and Mary call him the son of God that the angels call him the son of God as we looked last week the only people that don't call him the son of God are the people from his hometown in Nazareth and the rest of the world that doesn't believe in him but everybody else understands and knows who he is and they submit and this is the important point they submit to his authority and to his power how does the demon come out? He comes out simply by Jesus speaking words. Jesus giving a command. Jesus saying something. The word of God has great power. Um, 
A person in authority simply has to command something in order for it to happen. If you think about a general who's in charge of a whole army, uh, the general simply needs to say, I want my army to be in such and such a place at such and such a time. He does, the, the general doesn't have to figure out the logistics of how that's going to happen. He doesn't have to order all the, 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 you know, the ready-to-eat meals. He doesn't have to get the ships all lined. He doesn't have to call the captains of the ships and tell them to get their ships all. Other people do that. So all he does has to do is speak the word. All he has to do is give the command. And everybody else begins to become obedient to it because it's his authority that, that has the power. It's his word that has the power. In Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. How did God create the world? He created it by the word. He created it by speaking. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Psalm 33, 9, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Notice that the healing of the demon, or the healing of the man from the demon is instant and immediate. It's immediate, it's instant, and it's complete. Having done no harm to the man. It, everything that could be done is done simply by the word of Jesus. In other words, Luke leaves us little doubt who is in control of all of these unseen and invisible forces. You know, you can't see demons. I can't see demons. You can't see angelic powers. You can't see Satan. But, but God can. And Jesus knows. And Jesus has authority over all of the unseen powers, over all of the unseen forces that exist in this world. And here, he's simply proving it. By having this interaction, he's able to prove it. Now, there is one question that might be worth asking here. It's a little bit of a tangent, but it's a question I always have when I read these texts in the New Testament. You read the entire Old Testament, and you hardly even see a hint of demonic possession. Once in a while, you'll see it once in an occasion, not very often. Uh, a, a demon, an evil spirit will inhabit Saul or something like that. You'll see it on an occasion. But for the most part, the Old Testament, you don't see a lot of de demon-possessed people. You get to the New Testament, you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it looks like there's demons everywhere. And you say to yourself, what on earth? Where, where did all these demons come from? What's going on? Jesus is constantly casting out demons. And I always I ask myself, why is this? Why, do, why is it when we get to the New Testament, all of a sudden we see all these demonic forces and these powers at work? And there's a couple answers that have been postulated here. Now, one of the reasons may be, um, and, and this is what you, you hear sometimes more with more liberal theologians, but they'll say something like, well, you know, people in the first century, they were, they were just highly superstitious and they didn't know the difference between demonic possession and maybe mental illness or, or schizophrenia or something or whatever. They didn't know the difference. Now, l let me tell you, let me just tell you that is not the case. People in the first century were smart. And I think people in our century are dumb compared to people in the first To be honest with you, I think we're dumber than, than most. And actually, I said this to Bremen this morning. He said the problem with us today is we, we have so many sources of information to, to get information from that we depend upon them more than we depend upon our own minds and our own rationales to understand things. I, people back then didn't have that stuff. People knew the difference between mental illness and demonic possession. And besides that, Jesus is speaking to demons here. He's not speaking to, you know, he, he's speaking to people. He's speaking to individuals. He's speaking to people. He's speaking to demons. They're real people. They're real things. They really happen. And there's a lot of them, it seems, in the news. So, so I don't think that, I don't think it's the people misunderstood what was going on. I think people knew exactly what was going on. Other people may say, well, the demonic activity is always present, and simply what happens is when Jesus shows up, we, we st st start to see a lot of it. And that may be true. Sort of like when the boss shows up, you know, then all of a sudden you see people act in a different way. So now the boss is showing up. Here, here God himself is showing up in the flesh, and now the demons are acting. Their, their true nature and their true character begins to come out. That may be what is going on. But here's what I really, here's, here's the sense of which I get about why there's all this demonic possession in the Gospels. 
The coming of Jesus into the world is a spiritual struggle of cosmic proportions. Remember the book of Revelation where there's this scene where the, you know, the woman is giving birth and the dragon, which represents the devil and the, the powerful forces, wants to swallow up this baby child before it's born. And you got all this apocalyptic imagery of what's going on, but, but it is somewhat a picture of what happens when, G, when God comes into the world. When God takes on flesh and blood, God the eternal, God the eternal creator whose throne is in heaven and all of a sudden he decides to take on flesh and blood and come into the world and care for the, the and deal with the sins of mankind, that's a, that's a big deal. And you can understand why the armies of Satan and the, the demonic powers would want to fight against that. They would, all, they would, be, they would be in a scurry. They would, be a, they, they would be all over the place trying to figure out what to do. It, it, sort, it would be sort of like this. If you, if, if you look out your window one day and you see a bunch of tanks rolling down the street, or you see airplanes flying overhead, and you see armaments going this way and that way, you, you're beginning to think to yourself, there's, there's a battle that's about to be fought here. There is a war that somebody is preparing for. And I think that's a lot what's going on in the New Testament. There is a war that's going on with Christ coming to this earth. It is a battle of cosmic proportions. And as a result of that, you see all sorts of demonic activity. You see all sorts of military hardware begin to flash itself in the world. And yet the point of it all is Jesus simply has to speak and it goes away. He has authority over the demonic powers. He has authority over the things we can't see. He has authority over all of those things which we're not sure how it works and we're not sure how things fit together. He, all he has to do is speak the word. And he has authority over it. But that's not all. He doesn't only have authority over the unseen world. He also has authority over the seen world, over the physical world, over the tangible world. So in verses 38 to 40, we begin, we see this little story here, this nice little story of Peter's a family. His mother-in-law is ill. And Simon, he, he's in Simon's house, supposedly staying at Simon's house. And Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever. And in verse 39, he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately, there it is again, immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now, there's something interesting about verse 39, and that is this language that says here, he rebuked the fever. Now, why does he rebuke the fever? And why did you, this is, I think this is the only time in the New Testament this language is used of sickness. Usually when Jesus heals someone who is sick, he speaks to the person. Um, he, he says, you're healed, uh, go and sin no more. Or he says, you're healed, go and wash in the pool of Shalom, or go and offer to the priest the sacrifice, or whatever. He, he simply pronounces the healing, he speaks to the person. But here he's not speaking to the person. Here he's speaking to the fever, he's speaking to the disease. Now there's two possibilities this could mean. Now the one possibility is the reason this language is used is because the disease has something to do with demonic forces or powers. Remember, he rebukes the demon, so now he's rebuking the disease, and so people think, well, he's rebuking the disease because this, somehow there is a demonic power linked to disease. I actually don't think that's the reason, though. I think he rebukes the disease to communicate the point, I have authority over disease. I have authority over fevers. I have authority over illness. Remember what happens when he's on the boat and the waves come, the waves are crashing back and forth and the disciples are in the boat and Jesus wakes up and what does he do? He rebukes the wind and the waves. Now he's not saying there's demonic powers in the wind and the waves, he simply rebukes them. Why does he do that? Because I have authority over them. Jesus has authority over disease and over sickness and over illness. You don't rebuke someone you, you have authority over. If you do, you'll get in big trouble. You shouldn't do that. Children should not rebuke their parents. Parents, on the other hand, have occasions where they should rebuke their children. 
and it's it's un, impolite it's immoral for it to go the other way how you, if you have to rebuke a parent you better be very very careful how you do that parents are sinful they sometimes need rebuke but as a child right you have to be very careful how you rebuke a parent you very, have to be very careful how you rebuke elders in the church there's there's instructions about how to be careful about that isn't because elders are sinless it's because elders have authority so you have to be careful you you don't rebuke someone you don't have authority over that's the point and Jesus is telling us he has authority over diseases the disease is then healed immediately and there is a complete healing. The woman gets back to work. Peter's mother-in-law, the first thing she wants to do is get up and continue f fixing dinner. This is the way my grandmother would act. My grandmother was like, you know, my grandmother, both of my grandmothers, they could cook these massive meals for seemed like un unlimited numbers of people. They would be, they'd be cooking in the kitchen, they'd be fixing, they'd be serving, and they, they, they were like generals in an army. They were in control of things. But if, but if they got distracted for just, you know, if, if my grandmother had to get sick, got sick or something, and we, she had to go back and lie down, she was worried about what was going on in the kitchen, I guarantee, even though she was sick. So here, Peter's mother-in-law, the healing is so instant that she immediately gets back to the thing she was working on, serving the, her guests, taking care of their needs. That's how complete the healing is. And it's all incumbent. But notice that Jesus is healing is instant, it's complete, it's varied in terms of, look at verse 40. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any, all those who had, who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him and he healed his hands on every one of them and healed them. All those who had any who were sick with various diseases. In other words, he doesn't just heal fevers. He doesn't just heal skin diseases. He doesn't just heal blindness. He doesn't just heal broken arms. He heals very diseases. My whole, my pet peeve about the whole medical industry is, you know, you go to the doctor and you have this one thing wrong with you and the doctor sends you to another doctor. And then that doctor says, well, I don't know what that is. It sends you to another doctor. You got to go to 10 different doctors before you can fix this one thing, you know, because they're, they're all experts in one thing and nobody's an expert in everything. Imagine going to a doctor, no matter what the problem is, and he can fix it. He can heal it instantly. And that's what Jesus is. It doesn't matter the problem. It doesn't matter the disease. It doesn't matter the illness. There is no other specialist he can send anybody to. He can heal it right away. And it's, here's, the, here's the implication. It's also all-encompassing. All In other words, it's any disease. It's any sickness. It's any illness. And here's the thing. If Jesus can cure any illness, that means he has authority over all of life itself. Why do people die? People die because of sickness, illness, disease, things stop working. But if you have somebody who can control all of those things, who can heal all of those things, then now you have somebody who can control all of life itself. He even has authority then over death, as we will see in a few weeks. His authority will extend even to the grave. Now you understand what we're seeing here. We're seeing God in the flesh have authority over everything that we can't see, the demonic forces, the spiritual powers at work in this world. And we see a God who has control over everything we can see, diseases, sicknesses, illness, eventually the wind and the stars, the sun and the moon or the weather, over everything that we can see. Is there anything left? that Jesus doesn't have authority over? And the answer is no. All of the physical world, Jesus has authority over. Now, let me ask you this question. What would it be like if Jesus came and he only demonstrated his authority over the spiritual world? Suppose the only thing he ever did that was miraculous was he cast out demons and he 
dealt with angels and he did spiritual things. In terms of physical things, he sort of left us on our own to figure out what to do about them. What would that be like? It would be incomplete. It would be an insufficient and incomplete salvation. By the way, I think we miss this a lot when we think about salvation. We think of salvation as being spiritual. I'm delivered from the guilt of sin, which it is. I now have a relationship with God, which I do. That's all spiritual. That's all ethereal. We can't quite see it. But that isn't just what salvation is. Salvation is also physical. It's also tangible. The whole reason Jesus comes is, yes, so we can have a relationship with him and so that he can restore everything that has been fallen in all of creation. That's why Romans 8 says, for we know that the whole of creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, comma, the redemption of our bodies. Did you catch that? It's not the salvation of our souls. No, we wait eagerly because our souls are already redeemed. We wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. The day when our bodies will no longer die. The day when our bodies will no longer experience illness or pain or suffering or tears or sorrow or regret or agony. The day when all of that will be wiped away. That's what salvation involves. It it involves the things we can't see, the spiritual realm, but it also involves the physical realm. That's why the Bible ends with a new heaven and a new earth and the resurrection of the dead to new bodies and new life. Jesus, you see, if Jesus' authority only extended to the spiritual realm, it would be incomplete. We are physical beings. Like it or not, you're a physical being. Your spirit and your body are joined somehow. And you are a physical being. And in order for you to be a complete person, you will need a physical body at some point in the future that doesn't die. A physical body that will be able to enjoy the new heaven and the new earth, the new creation that God is restoring and bringing about even now. Jesus' authority means... He is, a, he, is, he is the ruler over the things unseen as well as things that are seen and are seen rather. And behold, Jesus said, I'm making all things new. Interesting way this passage ends with verse 42 to 44. Um, it's simply, there's a whole sermon here which I'm not gonna preach this morning, but in verse 42, he departs and he goes to a desolate place. Sort of reminds you of that wilderness thing, right? He's, he has to get away for, for a minute to re, rejuvenate. He goes to a desolate place, but the people sought him. He goes to a desolate place to pray, by the way. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from them leaving him. In other words, you, you have this power, stay with us. Use this power to heal, heal our sicknesses. Use this power to to, to make us use this power to cast out our demons. Forget anybody else. Let you stay here with us. But Jesus said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. In other words, Jesus says, this is such good news that I have authority and power over the seen and the unseen world that it's worth proclaiming everywhere. Don't just keep it to yourself which is why Matthew 28, we read this as we started, all authority, the last words Jesus speaks to his disciples, the very last thing they hear him say is, all authority in heaven and on earth, seen and unseen, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Take this authority that I have and proclaim it throughout the world. Proclaim it to the nations. Go in my name and therefore take my authority with you because this is the purpose I came. This is exactly what happens in these last couple of verses. Jesus said, no, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to take, take this message to the whole world. And that's exactly what he does through people like you and me, by the way. All right, let's conclude this way then. What, is, what does this mean then for all of us? If there is nothing in this world, seen or unseen, that Christ does not have power and authority over, 
then, and find me one example in the, all of the Bible. I, I, will, I will give you everything I own if you find one example in all of the Bible that Jesus does not have authority over. He has authority over everything. In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then this must mean only one thing. It can only mean one thing, that Jesus himself is God. That Jesus himself is the ultimate authority of all things. And here's the, here's the second point then. If Jesus has complete over all authority over all things, why am I so reluctant to surrender my life to him? You ever wondered about that? Why am I so reluctant to give up the things that I own, to give up my pride, to give up my sin, to give, to give up all, of, all of the things that I think are important, cling to my dreams, my plans, my hopes, my desires. I, I, they're real important. Why? If Jesus has authority, why am, I, why am I so unwilling to surrender to his authority? Now, here's the interesting thing about Jesus. Jesus has authority over you whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not. That's not the question. The question isn't, does Jesus have authority over my life? The question is, am I going to willingly, lovingly, compassionately, excitedly submit to his authority, or am I going to rebel against it? Jesus had authority over the demons. The demons did, the difference was the demons didn't like it. They didn't like his authority. Here's our choice. Our choice is we can readily receive Jesus' authority and rule and submit to it with love and compassion, or we can rebel against it. That's the choice we face. It isn't a choice that he has authority, because he does. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go. Surrender to me and tell the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know this morning who you are. You are the Son of God. And we know this morning who we are. We are broken sinners in need of grace. May you take our lives, may you rule in us, and may you show us how to submit to you each and every day so our lives can be filled with the hope and the joy and the peace that can only come in living in subjection to your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen.